Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Hello, 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 everyone, and uh, welcome to another interview for the Idea to Value podcast. I'm very happy to have Robbie Robertson with us today. Uh, Hi there. Robbie's a partner at Deloitte, and uh, today we're going to be talking about spaces, workspaces, and how they affect the type of work that people can actually accomplish in that space. Um, so, Robbie, before we get started, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be interested in designing the perfect workspace? Yes, of course. Happy to do so. So uh, I've been um, a designer for about 23 years now. I uh, specialized in interior design and architecture, but really was passionate about and, and really excited about what and how people use space from an experience perspective. So uh, before human-centered design uh, was a thing, uh, I used to talk about and refer to saying, imagine if you can stand in the customer's shoes or the employee's shoes and experience the world around them. What would that be and how would you be able to design the space to make that experience as best as possibly can? So that was always been my kind of starting point. And uh, over the last uh, three and a half years, I've been at Deloitte Digital. I had my own company for 10 years uh, called Mashup. And uh, Deloitte, we were working very closely. Um, and I was looking at the spatial components of experience and, and defining what those experiences were. And I started working in partnership with Deloitte Digital, looking at the digital experiences. So coming together to create omni-channel experiences. And uh, once we had and undertaken a few projects together for clients. They kind of thought, this is great. We can take this out to other clients. Would you like to come and join us here at Deloitte? And I said, I'd love to, but I have a team of 15. I'd love to bring them with us. And they said, great, you can, no problem. And that was the starting point or the germination of the experience design team that we have today. So what does experience design mean? And I mean, I work at Deloitte as well. We do hardcore number crunching, sort of statistical analysis. How, how does design and uh, experiential design fit into designing uh, the best performing business? Absolutely. Oh, that's, that's funny. I, I'm smiling because I just literally had this conversation with one of our clients this morning. It's the continuous elephant in the room. Uh, they kind of look at you and go, why am I sitting in front of Deloitte talking about design? And then when I start to provide the stats around the sheer size and scale of our design capabilities here at Deloitte, you know, we have 34 studios, we have eight and a half thousand designers globally that all work and connect together. We have, we offer every design discipline that you can think of. And just if you come back down to my world and experience design, uh, it is, uh, we've got spatial design or interior designers, we've got service designers, we've got um, storytellers, we have visual designers, we have um, um, video, video specialists, uh, we have above the line creatives, so we look at media and advertising, and we also have below the line in terms of brand and uh, direct to market. So uh, there's, we have have all the design disciplines all together here. I think that's what makes us so unique and why we put together experience and design. Because if you think about what we are all deeply passionate about doing, it's about um, using design and design thinking and design frameworks to help to solve the really complex business challenges that our clients bring to us. But we also want to ensure that we create fantastic experiences for them too. It can't just be really dry and straightforward and logical. It needs to be fun and engaging and exciting and things that people lean into and they go, wow, that was not what I expected from a bank or from an insurance company or from uh, or from anyone else, one of the other clients that we work from with. So uh, for us, is we can get to bring design and experiences together, we're doing our job every day. And what I'd like to get your insight on now is what difference especially spatial design can actually make to the performance of a company have you got any sort of examples about uh really bad 
uh, experience or spatial design and the impact that has mm. and how some sort of changes that you might be able to tell the audience about what sort of impact they can have. Yeah, absolutely. So we uh, look at the context of space in terms of workplace design through the con uh, confines of the framework of work, worker and workplace. So as designers, our interior designers and architects, in, 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 in terms of designers in this context, uh, our role in REMIT has been pretty uh, not challenged or has been pretty straightforward for the last, oh, I don't know, 100 years. We come in, we design a physical space, and we leave. However, if we take that human-centric approach that I was mentioning before, and you know we're seeing many of our of the architect firms and interior design firms now really adopting this, where we go, well, what is the experience that we want to create for the employee, i.e., the worker? What are you asking them to do from a work perspective? How are we using technology? today in a way that we've never had the chance or the opportunity to use it in the past and how is that unshackling us from the uh, the work settings that have become so traditional or norm in the, in a, any work in any working environment so for example you know with technology we know we we now no longer have a desktop and uh, a, a, that is linked or locked into the into the desk that we have, or the computer that we have like, locked in the desk we have. Most of us work on laptops, and that means that we can literally pick up the device that we do most of our work on, and we can move it to any place within a physical space. So um, that's great. So we've just taken ourselves and unshackled ourselves from from the desks. That's great. Now imagine if we start to say, well, I actually don't need to sit with the team I'm in because I actually spend more time working with another team. I want to go and sit with them. So we're unshackling ourselves from our team structure or department structure that we have. And then we start to start to apply new ways of working. So agile way of working, it's become quite popular in many organizations where instead of being in a department base, you're in a team based infrastructure where it's outcome solutions and outcome base is what is what we're driving it. So rather than just going, I come to work every day and I just do a job, you go, I come to work today because I'm part of a squad that is answering that problem and I will be part of that team for anything between four weeks and four months. And how I work with that team construct is very different every time I move into that new project structure. That means that what we're asking from our teams in terms of how they work in terms of collaboration, in terms of stand-ups, in terms of sharing knowledge, in terms of problem solving in groups, really um, removes the need for us to have a fixed desk. We don't need that fixed desk any longer. No, because I never would use it. I'd be with the project teams. So suddenly we've got the old way of designing spaces is becoming less um, um, important and, and becoming more redundant. And we start having to ensure that we're designing spaces that are just as flexible as the team constructs and the, and the challenges that, are the, that our, our peers and our, our organizations are giving us to answer. So imagine if we could hardwire flexibility into our spaces that you could come in as a team and hack the space and, and go, we're a team of eight and we need, this is what we need to do. We need actually, a lot of the work we do is quite quiet. It's going to be a lot of research based. So we need a quiet space. And then only once a day do we come together to share insights. That space is quite different that if you were a team of 16 and it was a complex problem and you need to spend 60% of your time actually debating and working together to solve that and only 10 or 20% 20, 20 of the time quietly doing some work. Uh, suddenly that construct of that space would be very different. And imagine if you had those two teams next to each other well, that wouldn't be very fun if one team was very loud and, and lots of noise and, and continuously um, uh, disrupting the team who are researching and doing very quiet work next to them. So what we're looking at in terms of redefining how we use space is being able to put the power back into the teams to allow them to find and self-select around the spaces they use and, and how do they use the furniture and the physical elements that we provide them to deliver the best possible work that they've been asked to do.
It's fascinating that you talk about flexibility like that because uh, there seems to be a lot of research out there that if you try and have one perfect office design, it's never actually going to be perfect for everyone. Correct. And uh, especially over the last uh, decade or so, a lot of companies have been inspired by what they see from Silicon Valley, this organized chaos, and they think, oh, if we want to have our stock price perform like them, we need to redesign our office to look like theirs. Mm. But uh, what, what's your view on whether or not there's an ideal design for an office or whether or not it needs to, as you say, uh, change with the times and change with the requirements? 100%. So uh, th there is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all office design. Let's get that moved away. They said, can get that sealed. That's never going to happen. Uh, every organization is unique. Every structure within an organization is unique. Every culture within an organization is unique. We need to understand what is it that you deliver? How do you deliver? Where are you in the world as well? So those, so those um, social um, pressures or, or um, uh, national pressures you know, are also very important to take in, in play. If you're an international company uh, and you have offices in the US and the UK and here in Australia and maybe in the Middle East, we need to understand the social fabric of those of those countries to make sure that we're providing the spaces to create the so to provide the social norms that are absolutely embedded into the culture of those organ of those countries, let alone those organisations. So, what we start to look at is what we start defining or designing what we call spatial strategies. So, strategies that help us to fuse together the the cultural aspects of an organization, the, uh, the techno technology and technological aspects of an organization. So, you know, how, you know, where do they sit in the maturity curve of the adoption of technology within that organization? And even down to the teams they work in. So if you are delivering a very traditional role, so, and that may be in one of our finance areas or in one of our legal um, areas, you, the, what you have done and how you work may not have changed dramatically over the last few years. But if you start introducing technology such as augmented reality or artificial intelligence, and suddenly we are being unshackled from the ways of working uh, in, 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 in that role or in that industry sector, suddenly the, what you do and how you do it is going to completely transform over the next five years. So we need to ensure that we create the spaces to allow that to happen efficiently, effectively, and without the fear of, oh, I'm, I'm out of a job, or where is this going, or what's this going to happen to me? Because what we find is when we start to design spaces, the first question that people ask is, how do I fit into this space? What's my role? And we need to understand what those symbols and ceremonies are that make up that cultural fabric that is connected to the physical design of that office. And we need to make sure that we do not remove all of those from that team to allow them to continue to storm and perform. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, from our perspective, is to understand the level of change that is already happening within an organization. So many companies are going through a transformational process at the moment. You know, Industry 4.0 is very much, we're in the thick of it. And we haven't seen this amount of change and the pace of change since the last industrial revolution. And so that it makes a lot of people fear for the roles that they have or for the roles that are about to become redundant. And they go, how do I how do why, how do I fit into this to this company and where where's all the skills and in IP that I have gained and 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 I think that I'm bringing value by contributing it to? How do I ensure that that has a place in this new, unfamiliar future that we're trying to design? So. When you ask a question around uh, this physical space and looking over to our uh, many fr our friends and these l amazingly successful companies over in San Francisco and this in the in Silicon Valley, what they started was was a purpose around what they that they garnered and 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 were able to pull together the right people to to who, who understood 
the role and purpose of what they were doing and how they were doing it, and, and they loved being part of that, that mission. That then created the culture, and from that, they were able to create the physical space that met the needs of the psychographic profiles of the people that worked there and helped to embody and uh, bring to life that physical element of the purpose. So if we can do that, every space will be successful, but it will also be very different in terms of design, layout and features. Robbie, it's been fascinating talking with you today. Um, if people are interested to find out more about uh, how you can change the performance uh, using spaces and experiences, uh, what's the best way that they can find out some more? Hey, listen, I'm, I've got a number of uh, white papers. In fact, I've just done a, a, future, a future workplace white paper that's on my LinkedIn. So and it should be easily, easily found. Uh, so you can go and have a look at that. Or uh, there's been a number of really good uh, white papers and research papers out there at the moment around the death of open plan, which I think is hilarious because we all saw this as being the kind of the, the holy grail for the future of office space. And now we're seeing that the productivity, the research is showing us the productivity is absolutely plummeting in many organizations, not all, but many. So we need to think that rethink what that open plan space looks like and, and how do we create neighborhoods and workplace settings that meet the needs of different people and what they want them, we're asking them to do. Uh, so that would be, there's a lot of research papers out there, uh, but if anyone wants just to, as I say, um, I've, a white, I've written a white paper on it and so my LinkedIn, please go and help yourself. I'll make sure there's a link down below the video here. Uh, it's been wonderful speaking with you and uh, yeah, I look forward to speaking again with you soon. See you soon, thanks. Cheers. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, please like, share and subscribe and leave me a comment about what you thought and what you'd like to see more about. If you want to take your creativity and innovation capabilities to the next level, then invest in yourself with the premium training only available at ideatovalue.com. These exclusive training modules have all been put together by me, Nick Skillicorn, and have been used by thousands of artists, innovation leaders, and CEOs to become better at understanding the source of their creativity and executing on their innovation ambitions. And there is no risk to new, as they are backed by our money-back guarantee. Now, don't forget to go out there and make your ideas a reality. See you again soon.